Hello and welcome back to another episode of The Lazy Entrepreneur. I'm your host, Sam Priestley, and today I've got a guest host on, and that's Dan Lim. Hey, how's it going? I thought Dan would be a good person to get on this episode, because I want to talk about how do you learn how to manage people, how do you become a better leader, how do you become a better boss. And Dan is a bit like me, in that this is something he's worked quite hard at, but I think he's also doing a bit better than me, because while I've all my real attempts to manage people have been slight failures and I'm not really doing much at the moment he is uh, managing more and more people and his business is growing and also we've been friends for ages we used to live together and whenever I get together with him we always have a great chat yeah we've known each other for about 11 years now so gone, 11 gone years. pretty quickly yeah hopefully hopefully better now is life better now than it was 11 years ago yeah I'd say in fact it's funny that you bring that up because I was thinking about it yesterday that Say my life is 10 times better now than it was even five years ago. Really? And, yeah. 10 times? Yeah, I reckon so. Has every year been better? Um, Maybe, yeah, I think so. I think so. I, f- I feel like I get a lot more done in each day now. Get the same done in a day and now yeah, compared with the week, what I get done in a week. Well, this is something that it's got nothing to do with leadership or managing people. One thing I've noticed about you is when we first moved to London... We were both mince around all day. We'd go for coffee. Yeah. We'd get up late. We wouldn't. We wouldn't really have much structure. And I still don't have much structure beyond now working quite a traditional day. Yeah. It really work. have shifted from kind of being a night owl and staying up till three or four every night to now sort of on a normal person's working schedule of getting into the office for for nine thirty, doing you- exercise in the morning. Yeah, because not only are you getting to work for 9.30, but you're also going to the gym beforehand. Yep. You've voluntarily done something that I've tried my best to avoid. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the complete opposite to the Lazy Entrepreneur podcast. Yeah, you started off by saying that we've got a, a lot in common, that we're very similar, but it hasn't seen that way so far. But I think I would agree that in general, we uh, we are very similar in, in many ways. Yeah. And, and also, um, I've really enjoyed listening to your podcast so far and so excited to to be part of it and hopefully contribute a small bit. Well, thank you very much. Well, one way we are similar is I think we both agree that soft skills can be learnt. That it's not just stuff like maths or programming or languages or music. Those sort of tangible skills you can measure yourself getting better at. But there's other things such as managing, leadership. I often think that even just being a normal human being, like being, <laughs> being able to hold a, a normal conversation with people. Yeah, well, there's, there's a book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And there's a whole book on that, which kind of suggests that you can learn these things as well as hard skills. Yeah, I suppose I suppose maybe that's true, because there are, I think there'd be more books about management than there have been about any other topic. But do people, do people work at becoming a better manager? Um, I certainly say that I have, and... In fact, that's one of the ways that I feel that my life is 10 times better now than it was even five years ago in that for some reason, maybe two years ago, it it occurred to me more that you can actually specifically try to improve, improve your skills, improve the way that you're at work. You identify having conversations with people or dealing with, with conflicts as an area that you're weak at, that you can go out and find a book or a course that deals with those things. Mm. And that's something that I have gone out and, and tried to do myself. So tell me then a little bit about, about your experience with management and being a boss. Um, I found it difficult and I still find it difficult. <clears throat> and say one of the areas that I'm still very much working on is uh, not being a people pleaser and being prepared to do things that, that, that people won't like. And um, there's actually a book that I've got my own. I think it's called something like the courage to be disliked um, so yeah that's that's on my to read list that's funny I've, I've literally written down here you know one of the reasons I think I'm not a great leader or manager is because I'm an introvert and I'm a people pleaser right like those two things it's something about wanting to be friends with people yeah it's yeah in some contrast to being a boss because you you run a company with a friend there's two of you yeah and you've got how many employees do you have at the moment uh so there's five employees so seven of us in total yeah um yeah and we've been running that business for about two and a half or three years now because you started off if my memory serves by outsourcing 
those roles to like an external company you sort of did a, a tender and got a few different companies to bid on the contract and then you didn't really have much success with that and then decided to move to having people in-house to work on it exactly so maybe uh, a way again that we are similar is that try to procrastinate and get out of doing some some hard work <laughs> the hard work that we tried to get out out of was hiring and managing people so I and also to take a, a step back uh, so it's a software company yeah so we tried to avoid having our own team we uh, hired a, a software consultancy instead to to build our our products and yeah we tried to cut corners thought that we could give them some vague specifications and that magically somehow they would uh, give us what we wanted and it definitely didn't work out that way I think there's something about hiring a contractor, like an outside company that's an, an expert, right? That means you feel like you don't need to do the hard work of monitoring exactly what they're doing. Yeah. And when I've hired them before, you have like a project manager from their side who often like doesn't have a clue what's going on. <laughs> and some yeah. programmer four or five rows back who you might never speak to. Yeah. Well, yeah, because you, you don't have the, the same quality of communication that you do when you have a team in-house. And actually that reminds me of something I definitely wanted to bring up when you uh, when you mentioned to me that we'll be discussing about this and um, and it's this experiment done at Stanford University uh, called the tappers and the listeners and what they did in this experiment was they got uh, half the people to be tappers and half the people to be listeners and they got the tappers to tap out the tune to, to some well-known tunes so what happened in in this experiment is they asked the tappers what percentage of tunes the listeners would get right yeah and the and the tappers thought that the listeners would get 50 percent of the tunes so one in two whereas they actually only ended up getting one in 40 yeah so the principle here is that as someone giving information we massively overestimate how much of that message gets across that problem was gets worse when when you're outsourcing it's the almost amount, like Chinese whispers, right? Exactly, exactly. And you have less of a chance to, to verify that the, the other person has understood yeah. what you're trying, the message you're trying to get across. Yeah. And that's the benefit of going through the hard work and an effort of hiring and bringing in people into your own team. Because there's two sides, aren't there? One of them is that getting a, a firm to do it all for you, you feel like they should have done all the hard work already. They should have a really good project manager. They should have found the best program or whatever. They should yeah. they should know the questions to ask you in order to get it right. Yeah, the the software consultancy we work with the the product manager really didn't do a good job at all. And yeah, but but we you're exactly right. We had that thing where we felt, oh yeah, we're hiring these guys. Like of course this guy's going to get do a good job. Yeah, and um yeah he didn't do much of a job at all in terms of understanding our requirements. And this project went on and on and on and. Actually, another thing that uh, we learned from this is that we should we should have made a, a decision much quicker to abandon it. Yeah. Because um, the very first bit of software that we saw that they had built really was terrible. And it had kind of <laughs> indicators that they didn't know what they were doing. They yeah. didn't understand the current best practices. But it was such a difficult decision to make. And again, just trying to get away from doing any hard work and making any hard decisions. And we let this project roll on and on. Yeah. That's true, isn't it? Because um, we both come from a computer science background, both studied at university. Computer yeah, science. that's how we, we know each other. So we know when something is just not going to work out. I've definitely had these, this exact same experience where someone's given me a bit of software. Yeah. And I kind of looked at the code and been like, terrible. This person doesn't know what this they're doing. This person doesn't know what they're yeah, doing, exactly. And, that, and almost at that point, you should instantly say... Oh, that's you, it, there's, yeah, no, you've there's got, no point. You've got a huge scrap of evidence that suggests that this person isn't suitable for the job yeah but it, it's a difficult decision to then make so quickly but that's what what really needs to be done there's a, there's a silicon valley mantra isn't there that you should hire quick and fire quick okay and is that kind of where you went wrong then with those contractors yeah for sure for sure that it was fine to hire them like you yeah. didn't make any mistakes there or yeah. maybe you did but the real mistake was sticking with them for six months a year or whatever when you should have at that first deliverable, realised this wasn't yeah, going to work out. Yeah, we could have... So the whole the whole project was meant to take three three months originally, which is stupid for, for many reasons, but we won't go into that because uh, quite rightly you, you were reining me in from jumping around too much, so <laughs> I reined myself back in. But as you were saying, 
uh, a minute ago about how you can identify very quickly that someone doesn't know what they're doing. We could have, we we should have seen that within two weeks because when we first when we saw this first bit of yeah. uh, software, that was that should have been enough. I haven't learned anything since then that I didn't know at that point, even two weeks in. Yeah. Um, that they weren't the right people to and, work and with. And how long did you but, get? Um, it's either six months to a year that we ended up working with them. And yeah, and, and we should have made that decision very quickly within within two weeks. And did they finish the project in the end? After the three months, when which we'd kind of paid for, because we paid a fixed amount yeah. for a fixed deliverable, after after three months, they sort of took more manpower off the project, so it kind of dragged on and on and on until we finally had to say enough was enough, and that's when we moved over and started hiring our own developers. So did did you end up paying them? Yeah, we did. We did. And did you pay them more than the fixed amount you'd originally agreed to? No, no, we did, we paid them the fixed amount. Yeah. But then once you cut in all the extra time you spent and the loss oh, I, of and the opportunity earning, cost, of, yeah, 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 that uh, everything involved was yeah, an absolute nightmare. Yeah. And then you got someone in house, and were they building the exact same project again? Well, that's Just another. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, that's another decision that maybe we should have made then is to just start the project again from scratch but we got them to carry on oh. on the shaky foundations and even today Oof. maybe uh four or five years later from when we first started working on this bit of software um we're still on those terrible foundations but again it's always difficult to just say let's start again i, I know from um one of your previous episodes when you talked about your tech startup how you basically had to throw it out and and do it all yourself in a couple of days. It was literally the exact same story. Started yeah. off by hiring a contractor who worked on it. This contractor was actually fine, delivered the work. Yeah. But then when we wanted to follow up work, he just disappeared. And so we made that decision. We got people in house, and we made a decision to just continue working on this foundation that someone else had built. Yeah. That we didn't yeah. really understand. Yep. Yeah. And it was terrible. And eventually it proved to be untenable. And I we had rebuilt it from scratch. And like, it wasn't a complete rebuild. Like I'd learnt loads doing it. But we should have rebuilt it from scratch in the first place. It was absolute nonsense. Yeah. It's, it's the same story. And I imagine there's so many computer programming projects that are exactly like that. Yep. But it's probably not just true with computer programming. There's probably so many other areas where... Because you've hired someone, because you've paid someone, you've committed to someone, you're you've almost bought into them. Yeah, that, and you and don't want to let it go. The sunk cost fallacy there. Yeah, but there's not just it's it's a sunk cost fallacy, but there's also the emotional cost of having to break that relationship. Right, right, okay. Which that touches a little bit on the sort of people pleasing side of things as well. Yeah, exactly. Like, how do you? tell someone they're fired yeah basically. yeah yeah yeah. how do you it's all right to say hi quit fire quit but how do you how do you actually do that firing yeah and that's especially that, when in the hiring process you may well have well you probably should have tried to build up some kind of relationship with them yeah personal relationship yeah tried to become part of each other's lives and spent so much time together then it's quite difficult to just say i'll see you later that, that it's over especially if you got to know them you got to know their family you know the the financial problems they might be in and the consequences to them of losing this job and all that kind of stuff there's so many layers that by being someone's mate yeah means that you have a very different it might not be best for your business but you want to be best for them yeah it's, yeah it's weird in one of our businesses, I don't want to talk about which one because I don't want to tell everyone who this person is, but one of the key people in the business had a mental breakdown um, while um, they were working for us and it meant they couldn't work anymore. So we had to make a decision. Do we continue paying this person? It's a small business. We don't have any money. Do we keep paying them their salary yeah. while they can't work? Like where does the where where does the cold-hearted, this is a business versus we care about this person like where does that intersect and they were off for about six months but it was one of these ones where we kept paying them but then all the other staff were very they felt 
they felt cheated that this person was getting paid for not yeah. working. They didn't really know all the details of the the mental breakdown or whatever. Like, how do you how do you balance all that when you're kind of friends with someone at the same time? You have to spin a lot of plates, and there's so many so many moving parts because it's not only your relationship with that one person, which is complicated enough, but then how everyone else feels about your relationships with everyone else, if that makes sense so many relationships and that just grows and grows and grows as you add more and more people to your team yeah and you're probably a bit like me where you overthink these things <laughs> oh yeah for like, sure. a lot of people would just be like just whatever just that's the right thing to do let's do it whereas i'd be like oh well, what about this what about that oh. um we've got a, a big meeting tomorrow our whole team is working together all day um but that that only got decided today that we were going to be doing that and um one of my colleagues and I have got this boxing session booked in at 12.30. And it probably means that we'd have to take an hour and a half to two hours out of our day to do that, which normally would be fine because we're quite flexible. And if you get the work done, it it's fine. Um, but now we've announced that we're going to be working together all day. It's quite inconvenient to to have to go to this boxing class. And I've been agonizing for ages. Oh, should I like make us cancel it or... <laughs> I mean, but the obvious thing is, yeah, of course, cancel it. It's, it's going to be disrupted to the day. It sends a bad message to the rest of the team if we take such a big chunk out of the day. I don't know why I haven't made that simple decision. It seems so simple saying it now to you, but it's just that problem of trying to be a people pleaser. I think it's like if someone who's going through relationship problems with their boyfriend or girlfriend tells you what's going on, normally you can see the obvious answer. I think it's a bit like that. Like once you're, once there's a relationship involved, it changes the dynamic quite a lot. Like what yeah, you care about. Whereas when you talk to someone else, there's an obvious answer to things. And how do you abstract yourself enough to always make the right decision? So when people break up from a relationship, the advice that most people give is don't ever talk to that person again. Like you've got to yeah, have space. Yeah. And everyone says that until they're in that situation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What was weird though, is that I even had, have had this, self-analysis about this situation earlier today so I even thought I even had this conversation essentially had this conversation we're having now to myself made the same conclusion and still dilly-dallied and deferred the decision until the tomorrow morning so you haven't made a decision yet no I, I discussed it with uh, with my colleague earlier and just said oh yeah we'll, we'll decide in the morning okay <laughs> yeah and you're you're saying we'll decide rather than yeah. I'll decide yeah when you're the Should, boss yeah yeah. Like what's got to do with him? Yeah. Let's go but let's talk a little bit then about hiring the right people. I think well, I've got this idea that if you're a really good manager, yeah. it doesn't matter if the people you're hiring aren't particularly good at something or don't have certain skills. But if you're not a very good manager, which I accept that I'm not, I need to be very careful about who I hire. So VAs, virtual assistants, this is something that Tim Ferriss and a lot of the other gurus talk about that, you know, get someone cheap from somewhere like the Philippines, you pay them $400 a month and they do kind of all the work that you don't need to do, you know, read your emails, that kind of thing. So I've tried doing that a few times and hiring VAs for things from customer service to more recently editing the blog and doing updates, that sort of thing. And it's never really worked out. And I think because I was basically shopping by price, rather than skill set and I haven't just been a very good manager so one of the main problems I had with all of them is they would do the job I'd give them they wouldn't do it particularly well and then they'd wait for me to give them another job so these are people who are working eight hours a day and I don't have eight hours a day worth of jobs for them right so for me if I wanted someone to do that role given the personality that I am I would need someone who has the creativity and the motivation to go off and like find because there's, there's a million and one things could be done on my blog for instance that if I asked Emma to do this role with my wife she would like be busy all day every day because there's a million and one things to do she could be reaching out to people trying to get advertising trying to get links to the site whatever but when you hire someone who doesn't think like that it's a bit different so for me hiring someone who has that initiative is quite important. Whereas I think if you're a great manager, that's a bit less important. But do you think that VA exists? Yeah, well, yeah, I do, I do. Okay. And it's probably, I've talked about shopping by price, but it's probably nothing to do with price at all. It's probably to do with me having a better hiring process. Yeah. Because I have kind of learned that you can shop by price, but shopping by price brings its own problems. You're then getting people who are motivated by price. 
okay. which aren't always the right people. So it's almost like you want to find the people who aren't motivated by a high salary, who are motivated by something else. Yeah. I mean, that's really wishy-washy. Do you remember we went to we went on holiday to Croatia quite a few years ago? Certainly do. And in Havar, yeah. we we met a girl who she was at Cambridge and she worked at Waitrose in the holiday. Mm-hmm. And you might not remember this, but something that really struck me about her was how much she bragged about how hard she worked at Waitrose. Okay. So she was working a minimum wage weekend job. And was going above and beyond, like working extra time. She was talking about how useless everyone else was and how she would go and do all their jobs for them. At the time I was thinking, well, they know you're going to do the job for them, so they've been useless on purpose. Right. But also that is someone who, even though it's a minimum wage job, isn't treating it like a minimum wage job. It's treating yeah. it like something else. Yeah. So there are people like that. So I do think there does exist that perfect VA. Okay. But there is probably a side to it. I need to put I need to invest more time in both the hiring process and I need to invest more time in the training process of getting someone to understand what it is I want from them. Maybe these VAs that I had before would have fit that role if I'd been better at telling them what I wanted and communicating. Do you think you've learned anything since around how you might go about identifying or hiring a VA? How how would you assess them? Yeah, definitely. I think for me, hiring fast, firing fast doesn't work because okay. I feel too bad about firing people. What yeah. I'll do is I'll hire fast and then hold on to people too long, even though I know they're not right. So I think spending a lot of time on recruitment and interviewing people and getting to know people and maybe doing try periods or probations where there aren't the expectation that the job will continue. More yeah. like set projects that they know that's the end date and then I have the opportunity to give them more work if needed. So it's more of an active rehiring yes, than a probation period, perhaps. And I think I've really got to invest in them rather than look for people who are going to take the weight off my shoulders. Yeah. So you basically don't cut corners. Yeah. Well, don't, yeah. well do what you do. Go from mincing around drinking coffee all day with me to actually working a nine to five out of your own free choice. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yes. the, that's the motto of this, this podcast, isn't it? Yeah. Work hard. <laughs> But there's, there's a certain culture, right, that if you're the boss and you're not working hard, then what uh, motivation do the people under you have to work hard? For sure, that's like a key part of leadership is setting a good example. Yeah. And that trickles down. Yeah. Yeah, because so you have an office where everyone comes in. If you mm-hmm. didn't really, if you turned up for like half an hour each day mm-hmm. and just kind of like wandered in and were like, oh, how's everyone doing? And then left. Yeah. And, they, and you're on Instagram like, posting pictures at a rooftop bar or something. Mm-hmm. I can't imagine those people would be working particularly hard. No, no, definitely not. And as a as a leader, you're the one last in the office and that's going to send them the message that, that you are a hard worker and that will trickle down as well. Um, and, and an example of where things haven't gone right on that front is we have a, <clears throat> we have a daily stand-up meeting where um, it's supposed to be at 10.30, but my business partner and I often don't, make it in quite on time (laughs) Uh, and and even though or or we didn't at the start and since then we've realized this ourselves and adjusted but by then damage had been done and it kind of sent the wrong message to everyone else and then everyone else had the same attitude yeah so we've then had to take measures to to re-establish those rules yeah but we made things harder for ourselves than they had to be yeah yeah, culture is an interesting thing. It's something I was, I've been thinking about a little bit. That how do you build a culture that you want in the office? And like again, this is something that people have written hundreds of books about, mm-hmm. is building culture. Well, I've been thinking about it a little bit. So say if you're Elon Musk and you're trying to get people to Mars, your hot like the culture is everyone has that shared vision. People yeah. are willing to work. 100 hour weeks because they have that vision of getting people to Mars and they see him doing that as well and they see him working 100 hour weeks as well and they've got that shared passion and then if you're in the military everyone's a patriot and they've got the idea of duty right. and they're willing to work really hard because of that love of country and if you're in the city and you're working in a law firm you're working in a bank you got your eye set on that partner position, that, that huge income or whatever, top of the ladder. Yeah, and that's because you can see the people above you doing the same thing. Yeah. Your your boss has got their eyes on that prize and that will trickle down to you. That's as 
that's what's aspirational in this in this business in this organization yeah because that is what you want right and everyone's gone through that hazing of working really hard for like hardly any money with the idea that they might get to that position at some point yeah then how does that translate to like someone helping me work on my blog (laughs) (laughs) well um i have thought in the past when i've read in in books are uh, set the vision for your company and yeah. um, your mission statement. But I, I think that you could have that, f- even if it's just for your own benefit, even if you weren't working with anyone else. Um, so you can have your personal vision, your personal mission statement. And even if you have one other person working with you, if you, it, maybe that would help when you hire your VA, you can, if they had that available, then they might know what you're all about. Yeah. And that might help them take the initiative because if it's just a, a blank sheet of paper, then they're unlikely to really be able to go anywhere with that. That's probably true. And there's, there's probably truth that all the stuff that we think will motivate other people, we probably need to motivate ourselves. Like, why should I be working hard? You seem to have somehow turned yourself into a hard worker. I'm not quite sure how. I haven't. Like, maybe if I had, like, a great, a good goal, maybe if I was trying to get to Mars, I, I would be working really hard. Although you did see behind the curtain there for a second, because I was saying that <laughs> can't make a 10, 30 yeah, yeah. meeting. <laughs> so something I found quite difficult when I had employees was working out what it is they, sh- they should be achieving. So it's quite easy to give someone a role. But how do I, without doing that job myself... How do I work out whether they're they're doing enough? How, well, how do you measure success? How do I measure that? success? Yeah. Well, it's quite, if I give someone a job, I'm like, go there and clean that dishwasher or whatever it is. I can. That's quite easy to measure. Mm-hmm. But if I give them a more general job of like, you should be developing this bit of software. You're or writing you a report be, or something. Writing a report, yeah. How do I know how long to give them to write it? How do I know whether they've used that time efficiently? That's something I've really struggled with. I have as well. Uh, yeah, so you still struggle with it? Yeah, um, it's definitely something that I've identified as a problem um, and that I want to, to work on. G- generally, setting expectations, measuring success uh, and giving feedback, which is another area, of, sort of a blind spot for me. I, I don't know yeah. how, if you've had much experience of, of giving feedback to people, so. Oh, I'm fine at giving good feedback. Right, yeah. <laughs> it's the negative feedback I struggle with. Yeah, well, that brings us on to discipline. Carrot or stick? Do you just encourage people when they're doing well or do you also tell them off when they're doing badly? I generally believe in carrot. Positive reinforcement works and has been shown by research that to be more effective. So I don't deal well with criticism at yeah, all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm very independent. If someone t- like tells me off, mm-hmm. like it would, it, <clears throat> it doesn't it doesn't help. I need all carrot. Yeah, but that's probably not true for everyone. Yeah, like some people need to kick up the backside. Yeah, and how to know when that's the right thing to do? Mm-hmm. So we talked a little bit about my tech startup before, which you came and helped out a little bit with as well. And there was a few people there who really just needed a kick up the backside. And I just never gave it to them. I, I mentioned before, I'll talk about a few times I've managed people. Let's go back to that. And I'll tell you a bit more about my experiences. So a bunch of different businesses where I've managed people. One of them was this tech startup where mistakes I made was I hired mainly kind of friends and people I knew. They were friends first and employees second totally the wrong way around and yeah i mentioned a bit almost uh, impossible right <laughs> yeah yeah um, i mentioned a bit earlier about trying to keep that arm's length relationship yeah kind of deliberately to to maybe guard against those issues yeah and it, it kind of works when you're friends and your partners but when it's not equal anymore because a boss employee relationship isn't equal and that does make things quite difficult so that was a tech startup I hired someone else to work on a business. I hired him on a one-year contract. Do you ever meet Beppe? Um, no, I've heard about Beppe. You've heard about Beppe? Yeah. We wanted someone who was good at writing content for a website, and okay. we hired a maths graduate. Right. A foreign language native maths graduate. Yeah. Like, it was terrible hiring all round, and then terrible management once we had him, because we had him on a year contract. We could quite easily have pivoted and got him to do something actually quite useful. 
Mm -hmm. But we didn't. We just ended up paying him for a year where he didn't do any work. Well, something I've learned and observed recently is I don't think most people like having vague open-ended tasks and it might yeah. seem kind of an interesting proposition i'll just have carte blanche to yeah. to do whatever you like which, which may well be fine but only if as the boss you're happy to take whatever you're given but if you have a different idea than they do of what this work should look like yeah. they do this work this open-ended task and then they give it back to you and you say oh that's not what i had in mind that can be demoralizing for everyone so i've kind of realized the that open in this house can actually be very demotivating yeah and people want reinforcement that they're doing the right thing uh, absolutely yeah so if you give them an open end task they've got no goals to achieve yeah yeah well the, the things that i i mm. was saying earlier that i feel are a bit of a blind spot for me at the moment moment but at least i've identified them as something that, that i need to work on myself yeah so how are you working on them um I haven't really come up with a plan for that yet. In terms of feedback, I'm trying to provide that as soon as possible, which I think has been a general trend in management best practices anyway, moving away from a yearly appraisal period, <laughs> which when you think about it, it's kind of crazy that um, you'd have to potentially wait sort of 11 months to, to hear it, get some feedback about some, some work you did. Yeah. Um, so try and provide that as, as soon as possible. So yeah, yeah so really so it. the problem with giving feedback, right, is once you give good feedback, what is the reward for that feedback, and how do you how do you reward good work, and how do you punish bad work? Yeah, I, th- I think the goal is that the the task itself is the reward, and that doing a good job and getting yeah. positive feedback is the reward in itself. And I think that is true, and it's definitely true for me. I do jujitsu, and getting a new belt is so meaningless in the grand scheme of things and doesn't affect my skill level at all. But it does actually mean quite a lot. <laughs> and I'm like, a, I'm an adult. I'm not a kid. Yeah. But I still like look forward and working towards getting another belt. And it doesn't mean that I don't get any more money from it. It doesn't make me any better at jiu-jitsu. It doesn't mean anything. But I like that visual representation. I like being appreciated for doing well and putting in the work. Yeah, how good do you feel after a, a good, a solid day of productive hard work? Like oh, I feel great. Yeah. And I feel terrible when I've wasted a day away. And I suppose it is different for us to some extent in that we know that we're directly reaping the rewards of our hard work. So that probably does colour it slightly differently from if you're an employee. But I still think that in general, if you're doing a job that you enjoy and you, you do it well, then that is satisfaction in itself. I think I agree. And I do probably overthink money as being a reward mechanism because it doesn't actually matter that much to me so why should it matter that much to everyone else yeah and something i do try to to do is make working with me enjoyable and something that someone might look forward to to some extent well that's a big thing right i remember you worked with a friend of ours for a little bit and you were just doing it for the experience so Mm -hmm. you didn't really care about how you came across and there was someone who was doing a similar role to you who was doing it because they really wanted a career in that industry. So they were working really hard to impress, making sure all the deadlines were done on time, head down, and you were just like cracking jokes the whole time and <laughs> always at the coffee machine, not paying too much attention to the work you were doing. And like by the end of it, everyone was loving you. And, and the other person, they kind of just looked over and ignored a little bit. Yeah, because you have... The, the, more, the, more, the more that you make the workplace an enjoyable place to be, the, the less you think about how much you're getting paid. Yeah. It, it's just an enjoyable place to be. Yeah. I think that's actually a bit more deep than I was expecting to come <laughs> out of this. Because it's something that's so true for me. Like, I'm not that motivated by money. I do think about money quite a lot. And I've got a podcast about making money. Yeah. So. <laughs> but, there's, but, on, but on the other hand, it, it's totally different to be, to, to aspire to have a level of security mm. and comfort versus pursuing money f- for for the for money itself that's which is a totally different thing which you quite clearly aren't one of those people yeah yeah well i think both of us have to some extent made decisions to prioritize certain other things versus just making as much money as possible yeah yeah for sure all right so we talked a little bit about managing people and our experiences and the problems that come of it let's talk about let's try and be a bit constructive like what 
can we both do to improve? Improving anything. So let's say I want to get better at jiu-jitsu. How would I do that? Well, I'd practice a lot. I'd watch back videos of me doing it and I'd reflect on what I was doing. And then I would go and talk to experts or I'd read books or I'd watch videos or I'd get coaching from, from the best around. And then I would get better. So how does that apply to a soft skill like managing or leadership? I think for starters, I'm going to read this book about the courage to be disliked because that's probably one of the key things that we've talked about. Is uh, Even just a name. Yeah. <laughs> Even just a name. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like something. Be, be less likable is yeah. maybe the key, key takeaway from this. Well, it's, it's also true about, say, writing my blog or doing this podcast. If I was a bit more controversial... I, it'd probably do better. Right, yeah, yeah. If I was sure. happy, like, winding a few people up. Yeah. Being a bit more partisan about, about my opinions. Yeah. Well, you're obviously practicing quite a lot. You know, you're every day, you're managing people. Yeah. So you've got the practicing. And in. trying to self-analyze and often discuss how certain management events have gone yeah. with, with my business partner as well. So yeah. do try to sort of uh, have a review of these kind of things. Obviously, there's always more you can do. You're thinking back and you're saying, did this work? You're doing a bit of trial and error, yeah. all that kind of stuff. And then the other thing, so you're doing a bit of practice, a bit of self-reflection. Neither of those two I'm doing. So that's something I need to start doing. And that's something I can do quite easily, right? I could hire someone to help me with my blog or with this podcast. And I should do that. Why don't I do that? How, how I'll do you... that. <laughs> <laughs> Have you thought about uh, what the hiring process would look like, what the activities would be? Would it be an interview? Um, mm. Would you get them to do any tasks that relate to what they would be doing if they came to work for you? Yeah, yeah, all all good questions and all stuff I need to spend a lot more time thinking about. Yeah, because that's something... Um, so in, in the process of hiring, probably interviewed maybe 40 or 50 people mm. and have thought quite a bit about the hiring process. Yeah. And try to make it involve as many of the relevant skills that the person would be doing while on the job. So yeah. rather than talking about doing the job, actually trying to get them to do yeah. aspects of it which are relevant. So for yeah. example, um, we'd explain, we, we'd give someone a, a scenario and say, oh, how would you go about building this? And sometimes we'd maybe deliberately make parts of it vague yeah. to see if the candidate would probe us for more information. Because again, that's going to be an essential part of working with someone so it, so if you were hiring someone sam you might leave uh, a, a crucial bit of information out and you'd want them to tease out of you and have the initiative and the yeah. intelligence to realize where there were holes in in the instructions you were giving and, and tease it out of you yeah yeah because i think for me like initiative is probably the the most important skill that i'd be looking for so i'd have to as you say devise questions yeah. or um, an interview style test that would tease out and work out if they do have that initiative you're trying to simulate mm. what it would be like to to work with you yeah that's a good point that's a good point all right yeah i'm gonna do it. i'm gonna try i'm gonna hire someone well that's exciting wow I, I i i do this every year and it always fails but this time will be different <laughs> but that's it each time i think i'll get better and i solve a problem i made before yeah, I solve a bad, a bad habit I was in before and do it again. It kind of brings us back to where we started. You said you started off when you first moved to London, living quite a lazy lifestyle, mm -hmm. and then at some point you ended up hiring people, um, getting an office, and now you work nine to five effectively. How much of having people under you, having people that you manage, forced you into that lifestyle change? I think on a it's, it's mostly just a practical thing. Being together in an office in the same room is the, the best way of working together. Um, and that generally that would then boil down to us working regular office hours because that's, that's the standard They're, and standards are there for a reason. So coming back to your question, I think it's just more of a case of necessity and practicality of why, we, why I've now sort of migrated to regular office hours. Well, and I think there's a thing that you want to be a productive person. Yeah. You want that good feeling at the end of the day that you've done a, a decent day's work. I want that too. And having someone who I know is kind of looking to me for leadership and an example to set for how they should be working. Oh, that's hugely beneficial. It's hugely beneficial for me, let yeah. alone everything else. Yeah. 
Yeah, I hadn't thought that that was where you were going with this, but it totally makes sense as yeah. a, something that could benefit you for sure to give you that extra kick up the backside to use your terminology from earlier. Yeah. All right, well, that's great. I think that's good. Let's end on the learning from experts. And I'm sure you've read quite a few books that I should probably read. Do you want to give me a few a few examples of some of your top ones that um, I should delve into? Yeah, there's an interesting one called Crucial Conversations. So yeah, you wouldn't have thought there'd be a, a book on having a conversation, <laughs> but there is one. Um, there's one called Good Boss, Bad Boss. Oh, what a title. So yeah. Um, it's like Rich Dad, Poor Dad, but the, <laughs> the boss version. Yeah. Um, yeah, I reckon those are, those are two. Those, those are two top yeah. ones. All right. And I'm going to read Courage to Be This Light. Yeah. Awesome. Well, cheers, Dan. Thanks for coming on. Oh yeah, thank you very much. I mean, I got some good stuff out of that. As always, I've got a bit of a kick up the backside. (laughs) (laughs) Cheers. Cheers.